Hey everyone, Pastor Ty in Ann Arbor here. We are going to be talking today about dealing with anger. Rawr! We all know it's a big deal and it's something that we have to get right in ourselves and in others in order to live with great wisdom. So stick with us as we look at what this angry thing is all about. Have you ever seen somebody who really lost it? I mean, where they just flew off the handle. Maybe it was the toddler in some sort of fit of rage or the middle-ager road rager or, or the sports fan who experiences some grave injustice on the field that isn't corrected. Whatever it is, I'm sure we have all seen someone lose it. Maybe we ourselves were the ones who lost it. And at times, seeing someone lose their cool can be almost, well, humorous. I, I love seeing my normally docile, blocky, blonde lab just start to lose it. You know, if somebody does something terrible, some grave injustice, like knock on the door. Whoa, you should see his rage swell as he charges at the door, barking full-throated, hair raised on his neck, only to turn immediately into a doormat as soon as the door opens and the person comes into the house. Just last week, I watched him really start to freak out over an intruder. This particular intruder was a serious threat. It, no, it wasn't a rabbit or a squirrel. It was a family of sandhill cranes who have become kind of celebrities in our neighborhood. In fact, there's a neighborhood email distribution list that goes around with pictures to update us on how the babies are growing. Well. He was standing at the slider door, neck with his hair raised, his, his lips were curled, he was growling, his head was low. He just wanted to shred these creatures. So I did what any good dog owner would do. I opened the door to let him go out and confront the enemy. And sure enough, he sprinted. Now, now time out, time out. So, some of you are worried about the cranes. Well, listen, it's the circle of life, people. And also, the cranes are now much bigger than they were in the picture that you just saw. And also, I knew how this confrontation was gonna end. So he sprinted out towards the cranes, head lowered, ready to do his worst, and then, he stopped short, like three or four paces, at which point the adult crane decided to open up its wings and jab its beak uh, intimidatingly towards him. Well, it took almost no time for his anger to turn to uncertainty, to turn to fear. And in fact, he quickly pranced back into the house, tail tucked between his legs, with me laughing all the while at his little fit of rage. Sometimes it's funny when you see someone or something lose it, but it can become unfunny, not very funny, if you will, very, very quickly. I mean, we were watching a soccer match uh, one afternoon, my family, when we saw this nine-year-old lose it, and what appeared to be kind of funny at first quickly became not too funny, as his initial sort of mutters and kicks at the dirt turned into full-on air fighting where he was punching the air and screaming and crying and racing around the field. And we as parents on the sideline, he was on the other team, we, we all just went, whoa, like that's, that's not really funny. This kid's got a problem. So whether it's a dog or a child or a parent or a, a professor at the University of Michigan, when someone loses control, when their angler anger bubbles up and bubbles over, it can be a tremendously powerful thing that if we are going to live lives with wisdom, we need to learn how to understand and deal with anger. I mean, you could be great with money and work extremely hard and marry a wonderful person and have great friends. And if you can't control your anger, you will lose your job and probably will cost you money and you will wound your loved ones and drive away your friends. It is that important to lose your cool, to, to have anger get out of control isn't merely a bad look, it is actually a bad life. Our emotions are connected to everything that we do and that we are and we need to keep growing in the arena of understanding and dealing properly with our emotions. Fortunately for us, there is a professor named King Solomon in the Old Testament who is teaching his son as a king to his, I guess, princely son. Here, son, is how you live. This is the art of living. And he, and he writes 
a study guide of sorts for life. It, it, it's, he gives all these, we call them proverbs, which proverbs are these little models of reality. They're like a flight simulator that teaches you what will fly and what won't fly in real life. And so as we read through proverbs, what we see is a number of statements that are supposed to teach us, that we're supposed to ponder and think about so that we will learn how to live lives with wisdom, with chokmah is the Hebrew word, understanding, insight, and resolve. And so today, as we look through the Proverbs together, we're going to look at this issue of anger. So what is anger really? Well, according to the, the American Psychological Association, the APA, Anger is an emotion characterized by antagonism towards someone or something that you feel has deliberately done you wrong. Now, that sounds right. I mean, it sounds a little bit sterile, but what is anger? Well, there's this sense in which anger is like an internal energy that, that, that kind of swells up in a person over a perceived wrong. It's like our hearts are like, a, like an internal combustion engine and something happens that sparks it to get revving, and we then decide to either shut that down or to deal with it in some other way, or maybe punch the accelerator, if you will. We, we sort of experience this mini explosion in our chests, in our hearts, and we have to decide how to handle it. Now, the Bible doesn't give sterile definitions for anger or speak of internal combustion engines. Instead, the Bible uses a, a different kind of interesting idiom to describe what anger is, or even the words for anger are interesting, which brings us to our Bible nerd moment of the day. Bible nerd moment of the day. In the Bible, anger is often associated with heat or a person's nose or a hot nose if you will. And the, the Bible Project does a wonderful video on this where it talks about God's character, but specifically related to anger. And it talks about this idea of having a hot nose or a face that gets red and nostrils that flare. That's the way the Bible describes a person who is angry. Now, we use idioms that aren't really that different, right? Like we say a person is hot under the collar right? Or they're red faced or they're seeing red or they have to blow off some steam. In, in any case, the idea is that there is this, a person witnesses something that sparks them, creates this sort of internal pressure, this energy, this, this explosion in them that either drives a person to do something about it or maybe to not do something about it. It, it, it triggered, it's a, it's a triggered internal reaction that we have. Well, today, as we talk about anger, I want us to, to talk about strong anger, slow anger, and surgical anger. Strong, slow, and surgical. The first thing that I want us to consider today is just how strong anger can be in our lives. Anger, because, I mean, it's an explosion, right? It has a tremendous capacity for good or for for evil or for bad, right? Like, like an explosion can be used to, 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 to create sculpture like Mount Rushmore or something, or, or it can be used to, to harm people, right? It just depends where that power is applied. Anger is too strong and potentially good for us to ignore. There are some of us, depending on how we were raised or maybe our temperament, who try to ignore our emotions or even get rid of certain emotions. We think, well, it's so dangerous, this power, that I want nothing to do with it. I want to try to eliminate any anger that I might ever experience in my lives. And so we try to pretend that it doesn't exist. But this notion is not a biblical notion. It's more of a, like a stoic idea. Now, I don't know how much you've looked at uh, stoicism, but Seneca, who lived right around the time of Jesus. He was a, a Roman statesman, playwright, philosopher. He wrote a number of letters about a bunch of moral issues that became sort of bedrock foundational uh, pieces, if you will, of Stoicism. And, and Stoicism teaches that in order to be really happy, to be truly happy and live a good life, you have to develop tremendous self-control and fortitude and overcome and even destroy certain kinds of emotions in your life, including anger. 
Seneca said this, we shouldn't control anger, but destroy it entirely. For what control is there for a thing that's fundamentally wicked? See, Seneca believed that, that anger itself was a wicked thing. But again, that is not a biblical concept. In the Bible, God is described at times as angry. Now, some folks will read parts of the Old Testament and they will, will start to think that, well, it seems like God is always angry. He's always out just to, to crush folks. He's always like, oh, like coming down thunder and lightning type stuff. But, but the opposite is actually true as you uh, read through the Old Testament. You'll see in the book of Exodus, for example, there's this evil guy named Pharaoh who, is, who has enslaved, uh, Egypt has enslaved the Israelites, and he gives these terrible commands to, to kill all of these male children that are being born among the Jewish folks. And it says that God saw and heard the injustices that were happening. So God became angry, he became animated in, in the manner of speaking, to do something about this injustice and this evil that was taking place place. But he didn't do it right away in the sense that he didn't just explode in rage, but instead what we see as we read through the book of Exodus, that God gives the Egyptians, he gives Pharaoh chance after chance after chance. There are 10 plagues, not because he's trying to punish them in 10 different ways. Those are 10 chances for the Egyptians to turn to the true God and stop oppressing God's people. But that's not the choice that they made. And ultimately, Pharaoh was destroyed because he refused to, to repent and turn towards God. Well, as God describes his own character in the, that book of Exodus, there's this moment with Moses. And this is what God says about himself. This is Exodus 34, verse 5. The Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children of their children's children to the third and fourth generation. A key part of God's description of himself is that he is slow to anger, but that doesn't mean that he doesn't get angry. It means that there are times when God witnesses the way humans mistreat each other that it makes him angry. He doesn't just explode, though. He gives things times. And as you read through the, the Proverbs, the histories of Israel, like Exodus, the prophets, and the New Testament accounts of Jesus' life, you will see that at times, anger gets stirred up in God himself. Anger is too strong and potentially good to ignore. Should God not have been angry over the murder of Jewish children? Should a mother not be angry when her children are threatened? Should you not be angry when you witness somebody oppressing or abusing another person? Of course, that anger could propel us towards good. John Chrysostom, who's an early church father, who lived in the, in the three, four hundreds AD, he said this, he who is not angry, whereas he has cause to be, sins. For unreasonable patience is the hotbed of many vices. It fosters negligence and incites not only the wicked, but the good to do wrong. So anger is too strong and potentially even good to ignore. Anger is also too strong and potentially bad to just indulge. Proverbs 29, 11 says, A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. The flip side of ignoring anger would be to just go ahead and indulge it, to just vent, to give full vent to your fury. That as soon as you feel something, you should just give in to it. Well, anger is too strong for that. You can't just indulge it and just give in to it. One of my friends, he, uh, when he was about eight years old, very kind-hearted guy, still is, saw, an eight, or saw a stray dog walking down the street and thought, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invite that dog in. He looks kind of hungry. And so he brought this dog into his house and he thought, okay, I'm going to take him into the kitchen and get him something to eat and some drink. And we all cue the ahs, right? And so he brought him into the kitchen where his little miniature schnauzer was having to kind of nap in the corner. 
Well, as this other dog came into the room and saw the schnauzer, all of a sudden, that dog that he brought into the house, which turned out to be a pit bull, just saw red and started to attack it to the point where my friend is an eight year old, had to pick up his little schnauzer, shielding it from a pit bull, lock himself into the bathroom and call his father to come home and to rescue them. And his dad had to come home with a baseball bat and try to like threaten the pit bull to get out of the house. Now, time out before you pit bull apologize, reach out and send me an email or something because I'm giving pit bulls a bad name. No, I'm not. This pit bull is giving himself a bad name, okay? But listen, he was very, that's a very powerful, you don't just indulge that if you don't know how to handle that stray dog or that emotion. You don't just give in to it and go, eh, whatever. No, 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 anger can be too strong to simply just go ahead and indulge it and invite it in like, oh, everything is going to be great. It has the potential for being bad. I love Frederick Beekner's quote here. He said, of the seven deadly sins, Anger is possibly the most fun to lick your wounds, to smack your lips over grievances long past, to roll over your tongue the prospect of bitter confrontation still to come, to savor to the last toothsome morsel, both the pain you are given and the pain you are giving back. In many ways, it is a feast fit for a king. Now, the seven deadly sins are not directly taken from some Bible verse. And Frederick Buechner here is not saying that to feel anger is a sin. He's saying when you begin to indulge it, when you savor it, when you like it, when it's almost like, yeah, how, how can I get somebody as a result? That is when anger becomes very, very dangerous. It is so powerful and potentially bad that you cannot simply indulge it. We, we've all been told or read somewhere that to let your anger just run amok can harm you physically. Well, the Proverbs points out that not only that, but mishandling anger has the power to undermine your very thinking. This is what it says in Proverbs 14, 29. Whoever slow to anger has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Have you ever lost your cool and then later you thought, what was I thinking? You weren't. You weren't thinking. Your anger actually messed up the way that you should have been thinking and caused you to act like, well, a fool. Mishandled anger also has the power to destroy your will. A man of great wrath will pay the penalty, for if you deliver him, you will only have to do it again. Well, what does that mean? It means that people that tend to indulge their anger will keep doing it over and over again until the consequences are so brutal that they finally might stop. Anger is so powerful too potentially good to ignore and too potentially bad to simply indulge. So then how should we handle it? Well, that brings us to part two, part two, slowly. This is slow anger, slow anger. Many of the teachings in Proverbs and elsewhere in the Bible on the subject of anger have to do with slowing it down. If you remember what we read in Exodus 34, it's that God described himself as slow to anger. If you translate that literally, remember that whole red hot nose thing we mentioned? It actually means long of nose. Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? This idea that, yeah, his nose can get hot, but he's long of nose. So it takes a while for that to sort of bubble over. Proverbs 14, 29, whoever is slow to anger, we just read this one, whoever is slow to anger or long of nose, has great understanding, but he who has a hasty temper exalts folly. Proverbs 19.11, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is glory to look over his offense. Proverbs 16.32, whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Proverbs 15.18, a hot-tempered man stirs up strife, but he who is slow to anger quiets contention. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. The key to handling our anger with wisdom is to learn to slow it down. In the words of Tim Keller, the call of wisdom is not to have no anger or blow anger, but to slow anger. You know, that phrase is pretty good. That Tim Keller guy might just be going somewhere. But... When we have that spark happen that makes us start to churn, that makes the little mini explosion happen inside of us, wise people have learned how to slow their anger, to harness it and direct it in the right way. So how? Do the Proverbs give us 
sort of any direction on then how we could slow anger. Well, it does, in fact. One of the ways we can slow anger is to refuse to feed foolish anger. So you can slow your anger by not just feeding like foolish anger. Well, look at Proverbs 22, verse 24, 25. Make no friendship with the man given to anger, nor go with a wrathful man, lest you learn his ways and entangle yourself in a snare. It says, listen, don't hang around angry fools. Because if you do, you will start foolishly handling your anger. Right? If you're around a bunch of people that are laughing, you're more likely to laugh. If you're around a bunch of people who are angry all the time, you're more likely to become angry. And if they are fools in their anger, you know, they're the type that are just indulging it or ignoring it or just constantly feeding it with little tasty angry morsels, you are more likely to become like them in some senses than they are like you. Do you, you want to hear something that you knew already? People who regularly watch the news or check social media report being angrier than those who do not. Are you surprised in any way? Well, why is that? Well, because we give our attention to lots of angry talking heads and ridiculous links and whatever else. We, 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 we feed foolish anger so that we start to get angry over things and, and, and I said earlier that it, anger can be good because it propels us to something good. Okay, when's the last time you watched the news with your checkbook in hand, ready to write it to whatever charity needed your help the most based on what you heard on the news, right? When, when's the last time you thought, man, I need to get down and vote, but first I need to check Aunt Bertha's social media account and check out all her links so I'll know how to vote. Well, when's the last time you, you listened to some angry talk show host and you turned it off and you hit your knees to pray? I mean, come on. The reason that we're watching and looking at all this stuff is more about entertainment and that we like to be angry. Not that it's actually changing us in any way. We're just feeding foolish anger often over and over again. And so if you want to slow down legitimate anger and foolish anger, don't feed the foolish anger. It will just get in the way and it make it harder for you to understand. Second thing we can do besides refusing to feed foolish anger is to reflect before reacting. Reflect before reacting. Back to Proverbs 29, 11, a fool, a fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds back. Again, if anger is this internal energizing force to some perceived injustice, then maybe it would be helpful for us when we realize that we're starting to get angry to ask ourselves a couple questions. What is the great injustice that I'm experiencing or witnessing that's making me angry? And what, if anything, can I do about it to correct things and bring about real justice? If you think about at the last time you got upset with somebody, if you had just paused and before you exploded, you thought, what is the real injustice happening here and what can I do to correct it? And you actually prayed and thought about that before you responded. See, what will happen oftentimes is we'll ask the first part of that question, what is this grave injustice? And we'll realize it's actually not a grave injustice. It's just somebody who cut us off on the road or who isn't treating us with the, the royal respect that we feel like we are due. Uh, what? And it's just that first question alone, we realize we're more concerned with our glory than the goodness of, for, of, of others around us or the glory of God. Just that alone will help us respond differently. But even if it is a legitimate injustice, that second question of what can I really do to bring about justice? The answer might be nothing or all I can do is pray. If that's the case, then that is the correct response. Then we slow down. We lengthen our noses, if you will. That's, that's more of a righteous, godly anger. So we have to refuse to feed foolish anger. We have to reflect and ask a couple kind of important questions before we just react. And then we need to keep always talking to wise people. If there's something that is making us upset over and over again, we need to talk with other folks who have great wisdom in this arena. Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm, Proverbs 13, 20. Learn to ask somebody, can you help me sort this out? I'm so angry, I'm so frustrated, I know I should slow it down. Can you help me slow this down? And the wise people around you can do just 
that. Ask them to help you think clearly about what you should do. So anger, it's strong. Strong for good or strong for bad. Anger must be slowed down if we're going to be wise in our lives. And lastly, dealing with anger ultimately means being surgical, which brings us to point three. Point three, surgical anger. Now, uh, again, I, I owe Tim Keller a debt on this particular language, this idea of being surgical as opposed to just explosive in our anger. Let's go back for just a moment to that little rage monster kid on the soccer field who's losing his mind, right? Just, I want you to just get that in your head. You see this nine-year-old kid just exploding out there into a fit. Now, when that was happening, I was appalled watching his behavior uh, on two levels. One, his behavior was bad, but, but more, his coach and his parents didn't seem to be doing anything to redirect or quell what was happening on the field. Now, maybe there was some situation that I don't fully understand. I, I don't know all that. But what I do know is this. If I saw one of my kids having that kind of behavior, I would, as a loving parent, need to react in a certain way to get that anger out of them. Now, what would that way be? Well, how would a loving father, let's say, need to respond to a kid blowing up in his rage in order to like redirect change, even heal that kid of that sort of anger? Well, would it make perfect sense for a loving father to respond to a kid's rage with his own equal or greater rage? The kid's screaming, Rah. and this, this dad is like, I can yell louder and I can kick the ground harder, I can punch the air more, I can mutter more, and I'm gonna go. Would that have helped make the kid less angry? Or would it have just sort of reinforced some inappropriate anger in the kid? No, I, I would think that instead of just quickly exploding, that a loving father would need to see that kid's behavior, would need to become internally angry about that kind of misbehavior, would need to go directly out to the child, would need to maybe get down on the child's level, level would need to then speak directly to the child's behavior, would maybe even need to hold the child's hand, taking them off of the field, all the while absorbing the kicks, the anger, and the rage of the child, and then having a quiet conversation off to the side. That is what I would guess a loving parent would need to do to try to redirect and correct and heal a kid whose anger is way out of control. They would need to be surgical in their approach as opposed to just trying to fight fire with fire, right? I mean, every parent who has had a kid meltdown, and I would guess every parent has had an experience where a toddler hit them or an adolescent said, I hate you, or a teenager slammed the door and got in the car and just drove away in anger. Every parent has experienced the wounds and the rage and the anger of their children towards them. They've had to absorb it into themselves in order to try to correct it. They've had to consider how to be slow and surgical in their response in order to correct that child's anger. You and I, are that child. You, you and I are, are those little ones throwing temper tantrums, if we're being honest. Each of us has thought things, has said things, has done things, has wounded people, has expressed our own little pride and rage, and God has seen it. And he's not neutral about our selfishness. He doesn't just say, oh, I love the way they're mistreating the earth and other people and themselves. I love the way that they're just disrespecting me constantly. He's not neutral to that. God sees that and it makes him justifiably angry. But in his anger, we have this great story that we celebrate because in his anger, he doesn't just explode and destroy all of us, which he would be justified in so doing. But instead he comes to us. He sends Jesus to get down on our level to speak directly to us and our misbehavior and how we ought to act and to even absorb our rage and our injustices to the point of dying on a cross 
He took on our unjust rage and God's just anger on the cross so that we might be healed, so that he could surgically remove that sin from us, that he could heal us and begin to put us back together so that we could learn what it means to really walk with wisdom. He was compassionate. He is slow to anger, surgical in his approach. And all we have to do is trust him, trust him to forgive us, trust that he will correct all wrongs ultimately. And we just have to learn what it means to walk in his ways. Anger, it's strong. It can be slowed. And thank Jesus that he was so surgical in his approach to heal us. Well, in just a little bit, we are going to go into a, a time of music and, and worship, and um, we're so glad that you have joined us today. We, we would really encourage you to, to use this time uh, to reflect on the sermon, to, to let God's word uh, sink deep in, into, uh, in, into your heart. Um, but before we do that, though, uh, we just have, especially if you're new, a few announcements for you. Yeah. We have two in-person services. Uh, our services on Sunday are at 9.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Uh, also, there are so many things going on here at GBC right now. We have details on our new men's ministry, information about the addition of a third worship service starting this September, and so much more to come. Uh, so the details on everything happening here at GBC can be found in The Loop, which is our e-newsletter. The Loop is the best way to stay up to date, and you may subscribe to it at gracehq.org slash loop. And then finally, here at Grace Bible Church, we believe that giving is an act of worship. You may give online at graceatu.org slash give or by mailing your offering to our 1300 South Maple Road address. Saint, would you close us with this benediction from the book of Ephesians? Yes. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God.
your final breath. Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell and no scheme of man can ever. 